four years, the Dow setting its most record highs in a single year ever. Let's go to Fox Business Network's Jerry Willis for how we got here and what we can expect as we move into 18. Hey, Jerry. Well, it certainly was a happy year for your money with stocks surging to their best performance since 2013. 2017 was beyond anyone's best expectations, one of the greatest years in 32 years in my career. A pro-growth policy, new administration in Washington, it's quite amazing, a lot of room for anxiety. It was an amazing year with a lot of energy in the market and awesome for the companies that were listed down here. Take a look at the market's performance for last year. The Dow surging 25%, the S&P up 19%, and the Nasdaq beating both of those indexes with a 28% gain. And few saw these gains coming. In fact, when asked at the beginning of 2017 when markets might recover, Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman famously wrote that his first pass answer is never. And oh, what a difference a year makes. Take a look at technology, the sector that drove the market's outsized gains. Amazon, talking tech giants, and that wasn't the only sector doing well. Consumer discretionary gained 33%, with companies like Home Depot and McDonald's staging impressive rallies. Materials producers also driving higher as investors look forward to infrastructure spending by Washington. Sector losers were telecom with companies facing high debt loads and intense competition and energy with an oil glut only now easing. In fact, traders say Washington, especially the White House, had a lot to do with stock gains as investors cheered tax reform and the president's drive to cut regulations hampering companies. Fundamentals didn't hurt with the S&P stock's profits growing 11%. Can we repeat this year? Well, it depends on who you ask. I really think it would be very hard to have two consecutive years of 20% uh, plus gains. 2018 is going to be tough to match 2017, but as the corporates get the money from the tax reform and put it back into their companies and give it back to their employees, you're going to see the market continue to drift higher. Trish, back to you. Thanks, Jerry. We know stocks were surging all year on hopes for tax cuts. Well, now we got them, signed, sealed, and delivered. Are they enough to deliver another rally? Let's ask Catherine Rooney-Vera, Jonas Max Ferris, and Gary Kaltbaum. Good to see you all. Gary, I'm going to start with you. How are you thinking about this year? How, how are we set up? Um, and can we continue the upside? Well, so far going into the new year, I've, I've seen nothing, not even a 2% correction. And every time something tops out, something new shows up. And late in the year, we got retail, transports, energy, commodity, uh, commodities really strong as, as we move in. For me, the only thing that can stop the market right now is we've had not had a correction uh, in a very long time, and we're way overdue. So my bet is sometime during the year, we'll probably have a 5 to 10 percenter, but as long as interest rates stay low, as long as these maniac central banks uh, keep printing money and keeping rates down at zero, and as long as uh, uh, earnings continue to be strong, which I do believe will occur, mm -hmm. I think the market will be okay, and I think we'll have another decent year. Oh, that all sounds kind of good, but you did throw that 5 to 10 percent correction in there. Let me ask Catherine. Which would uh, because, be normal. But, but, you know, there's a lot of good fundamentals out there, aren't there, Catherine? There are, and I'll say that I'll take the other side of that, Gary. I okay. don't think that markets die of old age. Economic cycles don't die of old age. There are some risks on the horizons, but it's not because we're due. Uh, that's not how markets correct. So we could get a uh, surge in inflation, okay. and the Fed has to hike, feels itself behind the curve, uh -huh. has to hike more aggressively than the market is currently pricing in, which is two, three hikes max. But to get that surge in inflation, right. we need to start seeing uh, wages improve dramatically. Right. We, you know, Jonas, I mean, what, it's been 30 years and people haven't really gotten much of a wage increase. Um, it, it, we're barely keeping pace with inflation. Does that change? given the tax cuts? Well, we never had tax cuts really going into this strong a situation, both with low interest rates, real estate prices already going up, unemployment really low. Everything's really good, except you could, you, if you want to argue that wages is probably the only weak indicator. And again, it's not weak, it's just not going up as fast as everything else seems to be going up, house prices included. So no one really knows what's going to happen. There's no indicator that's going to say the market's going to tank or the economy's going to tank any more than there was in 2000 when the last time consumer confidence was about this high. Really, the only risk is too much confidence and too much, you know, it has to turn at some point. It's not going to go on for, it might not but, die but of old you, age, but it okay. does die. But, but and that's, compare. you don't know when it's going to happen. I, I want to follow that through, Jonas, because you're saying, you know, basically in 2000, suddenly everybody woke up and said, yeah, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to have some crazy 
insane valuation on uh, some sneaker company just because they happen to sell sneakers online. I mean, that was when reality right. caught up with people. But I'll tell you, as that whole thing was uh, uh, developing, I really questioned it. And I think a lot of people were out there questioning it. I don't know as I'm hearing as many questions right now, Jonas. Is that fair? I mean, it, it feels like economic fundamentals are improving. We got policy uh, yeah. that, that's making sense on the economic front. What is it that's crazy right now? Well, and that's the we might only be in 1997 argument. There could be a few more years of this to come before we get to really insane levels. The last two crashes and major recessions really happened because bubbles popped. Then it was tech stocks, and in 05, 06, 07, it was real estate, which was overpriced and too much of people's assets. We don't really have a tremendous underlying bubble, but I tell you, it's getting close both in stocks and this whole cryptocurrency thing. You know, how many trillions of dollars of market value do you think you have wrapped up in that before when that collapse happens, that causes a recession? I don't think we're quite there yet. But it's getting close to the dot-com bubble size in, in total value almost. So I think this things to watch out for. And they're based in overconfidence and over this wealth effect going too far. It's too much of a good thing. But, I, again, we're probably not there yet. You probably can say it's got a couple mm, more years before things head. get yeah. totally insane. I, I'll have to take the other side of that, too, because I do think there's a bubble in, in Bitcoin. But I don't think there's a bubble in the S&P 500. What moves equity, equity prices? It's earnings. What moves earnings? You know, growing your bottom line. You can do that very easily yeah, and very quickly by cutting taxes, cutting costs. What cuts costs? Well, right? You, can, you we, cut we costs by cutting taxes and, and cutting regulation. But both of which are happening. Right, but by the same logic, so far, there was so no bubble in the S&P 500 back in 05, okay. 06. It was the real estate bubble when that came down that took down the S&P 500. You could have the same thing if a different bubble comes right, down. Right, right. So, but, we, we, but we don't see a bubble really on the horizon. And Gary, you know, I know you talked about 5%, 10% correction, which would be, you know, theoretically healthy for markets. Those things happen all yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing out there lurking as far as anyone sees right now in the here and now that could cause this whole thing to come crashing down? I mean, maybe if tax reform hadn't gotten through, Gary, but it did. Well, uh, let me say this. You never know what's on the horizon, but we still have massive debt, massive deficits. They are going to grow. And, but I said, as long as interest rates cooperate, that for me is the big uh, matzo ball out there, that if <laughs> interest rates all of a sudden get out of hand to the upside, then I think the market... Uh, can take the hit. And, and let me but just that would, repeat that would require all there ice, being all, a lot of inflation in the economy. N not necessarily. Just remember, we're very, very low. And if they just decide, to, if, if rates itself, just the market itself normalizes, you can go back into the threes and fours on the 10-year. I think that affects markets. But just to go back to one thing I said, because I don't think I was understood. All I'm saying is 5 to 10 percent would be as normal as normals can be. The one thing we didn't have in 2017 was a real good ebb and flow. You're supposed to have corrections along the way, and we didn't hardly see any of them. And I just think we're yeah. doing, I think, Probably 2018, we'll see it, but I think it's going to be a no biggie at this point in high time. High after high after high. Um, you're predicting 3,000 on the S&P, Catherine? Yeah, I think we get to 3,000. Of course, there's risks. You have geopolitical risks. You have policy risk. The administration could leave NAFTA and WTO. These are things that would precipitate a correction, I think, 5 to 10 percent. But with earnings growth validating current multiples, we can get to 20, 2950, 3,000, I think, by the end of next year. Wow. All right. We're watching all of it. It's so good to see you guys. The Senate is getting back to work this week, and time is already ticking to avoid a government shutdown. We're on it. Plus, major airport fires, a deadly Amtrak derailment, and a new signal from the president that Democrats are going to help him fix these problems. The calm before the D.C. storm. The Senate getting back to work this week, the House in session next week, and they're already on the clock. They've got until midnight, January 19th, to come up with a spending plan, or else they'll give us a government shutdown. Let's go to Fox Business Network's Blake Berman with the very latest. Hi, Blake. It's not like this White House or Congress will be able to ease right into 2018. Right off the bat, they will have to fend off yet again another government shutdown. Before heading out of town for their holiday break, Congress punted the latest spending decisions to January 19th. That's now the deadline to avert the next looming shutdown. The same issues here still remain. Funding levels need to be set, while the debate ensues over money for the border wall and how to treat dreamers, the children who were brought into this country illegally by their parents. The administration has also signaled the president is likely to sign an executive order this month 
month that would allow for rewriting health care rules so that it will be easier to buy health plans at a lower cost because they don't have all of the coverage requirements that are written into the Affordable Care Act. The top agenda item, though, right off the bat will be an infrastructure package, and President Trump does not think that will be too big of a lift. Infrastructure is by far the easiest. People want it, Republicans and Democrats. We're going to have tremendous Democrat support on in infrastructure, as you know. Uh, I could have started with infrastructure. I actually wanted to save the easy one for the one down the road. So we'll be having that done pretty quickly. The administration has called for roughly $200 billion in direct federal spending with a total package of about a trillion dollars through public-private partnerships and other incentives. However, Democrats want to see that direct federal spending number much higher than $200 billion. Trish? Thanks, Blake. So does President Trump see a highway to work with Democrats in the new year? My budget proposal includes a massive investment in new federal support for infrastructure. No longer will we allow the infrastructure of our magnificent country to crumble and decay. I really do believe we're going to have a lot of bipartisan work done. And maybe we start with infrastructure, because I really believe infrastructure can be bipartisan. And there's new urgency to fix things up across the country in the wake of some major airport fires and, of course, that deadly Amtrak train derailment in Washington state. But even if you can get a deal, can we deal with the cost? Let's go right now to Ashley Pratt, uh, who's not so sure we can, but Blake Rutherford thinks we can't afford to wait any longer here. Blake, uh, why? Well, I think we've got real infrastructure challenges. I mean, I think it's it's not a it's not a partisan issue in recognizing that we we have we have decaying infrastructure all across the country in red and blue states. We need to come up with a solution. Although I do think it's going to be a tricky situation in light of the tax bill. How do we pay for it? Is a question we haven't really heard from the president and Congress hasn't address this issue. It's been focused on other things in 20, in 2017. We'll see what 2018 looks like. Yeah, Ashley, um, you know, the, the, it's adding up, right? We, we better get a lot of economic growth. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not going to be able to pay the bill here. Well, and that's part of the problem. You know, it's all fine and nice to say that this isn't a partisan issue, but it is when it comes down to how we go about paying for it. Democrats obviously see this as something that should be funded by the federal government. Republicans will see this as something that is a necessary evil in the sense that it needs to get done, but how do we address it and pay for it? Can it be a public-private mm -hmm. endeavor? Can it be something that, you know, companies or localities can invest in and there would be a government incentive to that? And these are all questions that need to be addressed as this moves forward. And what we have seen so far when it comes to legislative priorities. The president has made this something that initially was in his 100-day plan, but this has been pushed back. So 2018, with it being an election year and people seeing their political futures on the line, how does this work for both Democrats and Republicans? Do they want to hand President Trump a win in a midterm election year? Do Republicans want to vote for something that will increase government spending? These yeah, are all questions tricky. that need to be addressed. It, it's going to get tricky. I mean, Blake, will the Democrats play ball on this? Will they work with him because they have argued that they've wanted infrastructure forever and hey you're spending other people's money here so why not get to it um, but but seriously I mean I I wonder whether they're willing to work with him on anything even something they want well, I, I, I think time, time will tell. Let's see what the legislative priority is of the Republican leadership in Congress. They just, they just tacked on several trillion dollars to the debt. So that's going to be a consideration here. The Republicans made that choice. They did it in a partisan way. They didn't involve Democrats. Now the speaker's talking about going after entitlement reform early in 2018. So the president's going to have to step up here and say, whoa, 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 if we're going to focus on infrastructure, let's bring Democrats in and let's start having a meaningful conversation. That hasn't happened in the Congress yet. So are Democrats willing to deal? Sure, they've got to be invited to the table. They haven't been... They weren't invited to the table on health care. They weren't invited to the table on tax reform. So we're just going to have to see. But Ashley, you know, this might be one where he's able to make that crossover. Uh, welfare reform, that is what the speaker wanted as the main agenda item. It's not what the president wants. Um, right. Politically speaking, how does it play out, in your view, for Republicans in 18 if they're out there spending money on infrastructure instead of 
saving people's tax dollars through some kind of welfare reform. Trish, you hit the nail right on the head here because the messaging that's been coming out of the White House are lower taxes and lower um, limited government messaging. And for them to really take a step here to increase government spending, increase the amount of kind of government reach in some ways with an infrastructure bill, infrastructure spending. This is something that will have repercussions, I, I think, on Republicans in the 2018 midterms. Now, with that said, there's already going to be questions out there about 2018 being a referendum on Trump's presidency. So he's going to want a legislative win. And if he can work with Democrats on this, I think he will. So I think this is on the president's agenda for that reason, because he, again, doesn't want to see this be a narrative that no, happens he, he in wants to win 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 absolutely right. and this is one that i think he thinks he can win on and he thinks would be a boost to the economy although i would just caution not to go the way of obama's infrastructure plan where we spent uh, 800 billion dollars and really wound up with no growth as a result so the critical thing for him will be to involve the private sector anyway we'll see what happens thanks so much it's good to see you both ashley and blake you know you think the minimum wage rage is done well now that several states are raising it this year you can think again <laughs> They shouted for it. Now 19 states and D.C. are about to deliver it. I'm talking about a hike in the minimum wage, which is kicking in today. But will it mean more pay for fewer jobs? Allie Stuckey, she thinks so, but Danielle McLaughlin disagrees. So, Allie, what has got you so concerned here? Well, you know, I'm not an economist, but I am a millennial, which means high school wasn't that long ago for me. So I remember Econ 101 pretty well. And what I learned was that when the price of something goes up, people buy less of it. So when the price of labor goes up, employers will buy less labor. We saw this to be true with both Wendy's and Target over the past couple of years. Wendy's has raised wages both in 2016 and in 2017. And as a result, they had to slash hours of labor uh, by 31 hours. And the same kind of thing happened with Target. When they raised the wages, they had to drive up the cost of their of their products. People stopped buying their products, and so their profits plummeted. That's the only thing that happens when you raise, it, when you raise wages. Unemployment goes up, and the cost of living gets higher as well. So these are all really interesting and important points, um, and there's something to that. Danielle, however, we're in an environment right now where I think labor has really been punished to the expense of capital. In other words, capital has been rewarded tremendously over the last decade. Labor has not. And we used to live in an environment where, you know, these two things were not so out of whack. No. But now they're completely out of whack, which means if you're a worker, it's a much harder future for you than, you know, if you're the one with money that's, say, investing in the company uh, that employs that worker. And, and how do we bring that back into alignment and not allow the government to do that? That's a great question, and I understand that sort of the conservative viewpoint being that government shouldn't be getting involved in the, the price of labor. I will say Ali makes some great points about prices raising that certainly will happen with a minimum wage going up. One place that a minimum wage increase helps is poverty. So 22% of people earning the minimum wage, they're not all teenagers working in fast food joints, 22% are people who are living at the poverty level. And a number of studies collected by UMass Amherst indicated that since the 1990s, 11 or 12 studies showed that if you increase the minimum wage, you decrease poverty. And that's something that we need to think about societally. Mm -hmm. Ali, I mean, how do you respond to that? Because I think we all uh, have empathy for anybody who's working hard in a minimum wage job and, and is still stuck in poverty. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not an America we like, right? We should reward work. And, you know, for many people, they're making a calculated decision in some cases maybe not to go to work because it's easier to just live off of government subsidies so if we want to encourage people to get out there and be working how do we do it in a way that is not onerous for employers 
Of course. Well, I, I simply don't think that raising the minimum wage is going to do that long term. I do think that we could see some instant gratification. Of course, people being raised above the poverty line when they make more than the minimum wage. Um, but as I was saying earlier, a company simply can't sustain that without laying employees off or creating automated systems. You talked about capital. Um, a lot of companies are willing to invest in capital like automated systems rather mm -hmm. than investing more in employees. And I'm afraid that if we continue to raise the minimum wage, that's what we're going to see. We're we're going to see more uh, self self serve kiosks that McDonald's and Wendy's rather than investing in more employees, mm -hmm. and then that's definitely going to lead people into more poverty because it'll lead to unemployment. Yeah, it's it's a complicated issue. I mean, because Danielle, the companies are doing what's best for them, um, and they have more leverage here. No, they, they certainly do, and I guess that's the question: at what point does government get involved to try and make the case for the people who are? less fortunate than others. You know, I was a minimum wage worker. I was a, uh, you know, I worked in wait I was a waitress for many years through grad school, but I'm not the kind of minimum wage worker that some of these minimum wages are meant to protect. And as I said before, it's about working people, full-time working people who can't make ends meet. Maybe, maybe, maybe this gets us back to the welfare reform argument that, that Paul Ryan has tried to push. In other words, maybe we need a system in this country that rewards work and helps people maybe that are on minimum wage, uh, helps them to, to move up the ladder in some way, shape or form, rather than just giving them a, you know, a check every week. I mean, these are, these are policy changes perhaps that we should be talking about right now, Allie, um, because instead of saying, okay, every employer, you're going to have to pay, you know, this much money. And let's not forget, you know, if you're in a, a different state or a different part of the country, minimum wage means different things in different places. It's not going to go as far in New York City as it may in Kansas. That's just a reality. So how do we address this? What policies could we, should we be looking at, Ali, to try and address the poverty issue without forcing employers to pay whatever we decide they should pay? Government decides they should pay. Right. I think, well, you and Paul Ryan are on the right track with welfare reform. Um, and you also made a good point about especially the federal government setting the minimum wage. It just simply doesn't address the issues uh, that are unique to um, communities and to cities and people on a statewide level. It just doesn't take into consideration the cost of living. Um, so simply regulating uh, a, a price at which people have to pay for labor simply doesn't address the issue at hand, yeah. which is that we have a system that doesn't necessarily incentivize people to work and yeah. I think that's where we have to start rather than putting a band-aid on a very pervasive and insidious issue some good points from both of you thank you so much a razor thin majority for Republicans in the Senate can they hold on that is coming up and taking a road trip in the new year you might want to bring more cash and it's got nothing to do with gas prices found out why next Good afternoon and Happy New Year. I'm Mike Emanuel. Here are a few headlines making news today. Protests in Iran turned deadly overnight as at least a dozen protesters were killed during demonstrations that began Thursday over economic issues. President Trump is praising the defiance on Twitter, of course, saying it is time for a change in Iran. The president is returning to Washington at this hour after spending more than a week in Florida where he rang in the new year with a positive outlook on the year ahead. We're going to have a great year. It's going to be a fantastic 2018. We're off to a very good start, as you know, with the great tax cuts and ANWR and getting rid of the individual mandate, which was very, very unpopular, as you know. But we are going to have a tremendous year. The stock market, I think, is going to continue to go up. Companies are going to continue to come into the country. Among the items on the president's agenda for the new year, reigning in the threat from North Korea, health care reform, immigration, and infrastructure. North Korea's leader promises that his regime is indeed a nuclear threat. In his New Year's address, Kim Jong-un said his country has completed its nuclear forces and warned that the U.S. is now within strike range, adding that he has a nuclear button on his desk. Ten Americans are dead following a fiery plane crash in Costa Rica. The charter plane crashed Sunday in a wooded area shortly after takeoff. Five of the dead have been identified by relatives as Bruce and Irene Steinberg and their three sons. No word right now on what caused that crash. And customers lined up in Oakland and across the Golden State today as recreational marijuana becomes legal in California. Adults 21 and older can now legally buy pot 
grow up to six plants and possess as much as an ounce of the drug. We're covering it all for you live on Special Report at 6 p.m. Eastern. Now back to your world. Republicans are coming out of 2017 on a high note with President Trump signing the GOP tax bill into law. But should they be worried about the 2018 midterms? Washington Examiner Sarah Westwood joins us now. Sarah, you know, I was talking with Karl Rove uh, recently and, and he expressed a lot of concerns. He said absolutely Republicans should be very, very worried about 2018. We know that the president's going to be gathering some Republicans there at Camp David to try and um, strategize how they're going to approach this. How challenging is 18 going to be for the party? Well, absolutely. In any midterm election year, uh, the party of the president tends to suffer, particularly in the first midterm election of any presidency. The party of the president loses an average of 32 congressional seats, and Democrats only need 24 seats in the House of Representatives to flip the lower chamber into Democratic hands. There are 23 Republicans who are serving in districts right now that Hillary Clinton won. So it is not outside the realm of possibility that Democrats could flip the House away from Republican control. That's something a lot of Republicans are really nervous about. And they're hoping that economic growth from the tax bill could give voters enough confidence in Republican control that they leave the majorities untouched. But certainly it could be a stretch to say that Republicans are going to have an easy time hanging on to their majority, at least in the House. What are the policies that the president can put forward and the House can move forward with um, that, that will help them? I mean, infrastructure is the one that he's talking about right now, but it, there's questions out there as to whether or not that would really aid many Republicans in that a lot of folks don't like the idea of spending all this money, money that, well, we don't have. Exactly. I think that Republicans will be running primarily on the tax reform bill. They'll say that they put more money in the pockets of middle class Americans and that will be potentially what they bank their entire 2018 strategy on. Infrastructure is, in theory, a good thing for Republicans and Democrats to try to come together on because there is a general consensus that this is something that needs to get done. Mm -hmm. But any legislating is difficult to do in an election year, and Democrats are going to be motivated to try to deny President Trump anything that resembles a legislative victory. So it's just hard to see any sort of bipartisan legislation getting through Congress next year. Yeah. And so we may just be stuck with with what Congress has already passed I, up to this point. Really? I mean, even infrastructure, the, something that the Democrats have been pushing forever? Certainly, there might even be conservatives that object to this because it'll be debt-driven spending. There's, there's not a lot of room for offsetting spending cuts in terms of what they may be able to get through on a bipartisan basis. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to use reconciliation for this, meaning they'll need 60 votes to get it through the Senate. So you imagine any policy in the Senate that gets eight, maybe now nine Democrats on board is going to be extremely difficult. And so because mm -hmm. of that, I think given the fact that it's an election year, it'll be hard to see any major piece of legislation getting through what do you what do you see in terms of the Senate we've talked about the house and and you know look they, they clearly have their challenges the Republicans do there what about on the Senate side well, the GOP has right now more or less a dream map heading into 2018. Democrats are on defense in a handful of states that Trump won, like in North Dakota, like in Indiana, like in West Virginia. There are Democrats who will be fighting for their political lives, and there are not that many areas where Republicans will be on defense. Maybe uh, Jeff Flake's seat could be difficult for them to hold on to now that he's retiring. But overall, Republicans are in a good position to hold on to the Senate, provided that we don't see some some sort of overwhelming Democratic wave, like the kind of Republican wave that we saw in 2010 in the first year of the Obama presidency when Republicans swept through the elections. That might be something we see in 2018, but Republicans are in a good position in it, terms of the It's interesting Senate. that that always happens. Why do you think that is? People say, oh, well, we sent you to Washington and we sent the president there to do X, Y, and Z, and you haven't gotten it done, and so there's a frustration level? I mean, why do, why do you see these flips? 
Uh, there are a lot of reasons we see these flips, but most of all, it's hard for politicians to argue for continuity when voters are not necessarily seeing everything they want to see in their daily lives. There's always something that they may be dissatisfied with, whether that's the economy, whether that's uh, security in their hometowns, immigration, anything that they see mm -hmm. not going wrong, the party in control typically bears the blame for mm -hmm. that. And so it's hard for them to retain their majorities for long periods of time. That's the nature of democracy, mm -hmm. I suppose. Very interesting. Good to talk to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. All right, so much for that tax break. One state wants you to pay more for driving more. Talk about a real pain. Lots of benefits. Now, the seven-minute workout is not for everybody, so you do need to check with your doctor first. Not recommended for older adults or people with diabetes or maybe cardiac issues because it is supposed to be seven very intense minutes of working out. With your Fox Medical Team, I'm Dina Santafanti. Drive more, pay more. California floating a plan for a mileage tax in the new year to help pay for fixing its roads and its bridges. It's supposed to replace the state's gas tax. And get this, one of our free market champions, Gary B. Smith, likes the idea. The Federalist Bree Payton thinks uh, we should maybe put the brakes on it. <clears throat> no pun intended. Gary B., what do you say? Why do you, why do you like this? Well, I always like a usage tax, Trish. I think it's the fairest way. It's kind of like what they did in uh, many parts around the country. D.C., where I was for many years, uh, just had uh, toll roads run by a private and public uh, uh, cooperation, sometimes just private. You're basically paying for the use of the road. The problem is, with a caveat, you talk about free market. I don't mind a usage tax, if you will, if you replace the gas tax. The problem is... Most governments, whether it's uh, state governments or federal governments, use that money for something other than paying for the highways and bridges. They put it into the mass transit or build skateboard parks or some such thing. It's like a becomes a, a government trust fund. That's what I don't like about it. Bree? You don't like any part of this, right? No, I hate all of it. Listen, I'm from California. My family is very frustrated uh, at the high prices that they're being forced to pay at the pump. Uh, and, you know, the entire reason why California lawmakers are even debating this whole mileage bill in the first place is because they handed out millions of dollars in taxpayer incentive to encourage Californians to buy fuel-efficient cars. And now that uh, a lot of Californians have hybrids, have these fuel-efficient vehicles, uh, the gas tax isn't paying off as much as these lawmakers would have hoped, right? Ah, so they're doing this so they're creepy, trying to elaborate innovate. plan. <laughs> Well, it's not even innovation. It's just a failure to recognize uh, the you know, basic economic lesson of unintended consequences. They couldn't foresee uh, you know, the unintended consequences of handing out millions of dollars in my taxpayer dollars that you know, I've paid to the state in years prior when I used to live there in order to encourage Californians to buy hybrids. They failed to see the consequences of that, and they're failing to see the consequences of this mileage tax. I mean, you know, we're not talking about toll roads here. We're talking about the government devising a plan to track how many miles you drove and tax you like it's a syntax. I mean, this is so ridiculous that we're even talking about it. If the yeah, state well, is unhappy, you know, look, sorry, it, you know, the reality is states all over the country right now are looking at this. They're all looking at hiking gas taxes. Um, and, you know, this maybe is a new way to deal with this. But, Gary, uh, you know, I don't like any tax hikes at all. Um, but there may be something to what you're saying here. In other words, a usage tax. Uh, this gets back to uh, things that we've talked about previously, privatizing highways, uh, privatizing bridges, trying to find a, a more economical route to all of these in the future. Um, it, you, you say this could work, and this might be a solution for other states. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I will grant that there's always a problem with government implementation. If they just hand it the highways and toll roads and whatever bridges over to private enterprise, kind of like the original turnpike system here in the U.S. was all private, it could work. But the problem is rarely with the government raising enough money. The problem is that in, in California's original, what and right now they're charging 41 cents a gallon in state tax. The problem is that all that doesn't go to fix the highways, only about 57, 60 mm -hmm. percent in California goes to fix the state highways. They redistribute the rest to cities and towns and 
other various projects that government likes to get into. So if they dedicate it, it really doesn't even matter what they do. I like the usage tax because it's very direct. But if they said, look, this is kind of that old Al Gore lockbox, it can only go to fix the state highways and bridges, then I think you may have a solution that's at least fair. Uh, Bree, final word to you. Yeah, I think that that's a completely flawed analysis of what's happening here. This is the state <laughs> deciding to track one's mileage and track one's behavior. I don't think it's any business of the government to know how far or how often, you know, I decide to drive my vehicle. That's that's totally ridiculous that they're going to try and track that and devise this system to tax me <laughs> accordingly. I think that this is social engineering and I think that it's wrong. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's good to see you both. Always appreciate a spirited debate, especially on California highways. Trump, Twitter, in 2018, someone here says his New Year's resolution should be to tweet less. Another says, bring it on. More tweets, the better. Who's right? We debate. You decide. Starting January 20th, more news, more business. To tweet or not to tweet? That's the question for 2018. And some want the president to make a New Year's resolution to stop the Twitter altogether. But get this. According to a new poll from the Pew Research Center, more than 60% of early media coverage on President Trump has been negative, And only 5% has been positive. You compare that, say, to President Barack Obama, who got only 20% negative coverage. Well, this is why political consultant Harlan Hill says the president just needs to keep tweeting away. Katie Freitas of uh, Olympic Media says the president needs to tone it down. Harlan, you know, you look at stats like that, like we just showed you from the Pew Research Center, and it's clear the media doesn't like the guy. They really don't. Um, and we could point to numerous stories and headlines and pictures, et cetera, that prove that. So if you're him... Isn't this a way for you to kind of fire back? You don't have to go through a reporter anymore. You don't have to have a journalist write the story. You can say it directly yourself. Yeah, so, unfiltered. So, so you say he should keep doing it and do it some more. Absolutely. I mean, look, I'm numbers driven. And, you know, he was wildly outspent in 2016. And the tool, the differentiator that he had that Clinton did not have <laughs> was this incredibly engaged Twitter audience. And he was able to leverage Twitter, and he was able to leverage the power of these rallies for enormous earned media. And he played the mainstream liberal media like a fiddle. And so, of course, they want him to stop because, you know, he used them. He used them. And he shouldn't take their advice because I don't think that, I think they're diametrically opposed to the President of the United States. Don't listen to them, Mr. President. You're doing great. And, uh, and it's, it's nice. It's a, it's a breath of fresh air because he's speaking directly to us. Okay, Katie, you, you don't like this whole Twitter thing. How come? <laughs> Uh, well, some of that breath, some of that air is a little angry. I think those knee-jerk, thin-skin reactions he sometimes tweets need to go. And perhaps in their stead, he should be tweeting smarter. I don't think the White House does a very good job of pushing its accomplishments, pushing out the press releases, touting the numbers. He should be doing that instead. You're right. The mainstream media covers anything he tweets. So he needs to be tweeting out all of his accomplishments. Perhaps that requires a little more trust in his comms team, but I think tweet smarter. Don't tweet more okay, and, okay. and leave the I, petty I hear, reactions to someone I, I, else. I think there's something to that, right? You can use Twitter to, to help advance your message. That said, if you're, you know, like the comms team and you're just, you know, tweeting out PR, you know, press releases all the time, well, Nobody wants to read that, right? I mean, the, one of the, the reasons why he has been successful, Harlan, on Twitter is because he's uh, <clears throat> authentic. Yes, that's the word for it. And sometimes, you know, it's not as polished as we might like. Look, in the past, <laughs> running campaigns, I've taken the Twitter away from camp candidates because I've found that it's been damaging. What is, that's not the case with the president. What he's been able to do is he's been able to parlay some of that outrageousness, some of that over-the-top character that he's been building for the last 20 years into a lot of really productive attention. And, you know, as soon as that changes, 
I'll change my tune. But in the meantime, he's continuing to engage his core audience, his core supporters, his core voters to get out there and spread his message. And when that changes, I'll change my tune. It's pretty, it's, but it's empowering. Pretty effective. It's empowering. It's effective. You know, it, Katie, it, it's really changed the whole political landscape. I mean, I grew up in the uh, state of New Hampshire, which uh, is always first in the nation in the primary. And what was really neat about it was that all the candidates would go all over the state and they'd have coffee in different people's homes and they'd get to meet everyone face to face and shake uh, shake their hands. And, and there was a mm -hmm. sense of really knowing the candidates. You know, Donald Trump went into New Hampshire um, and he didn't have to do any of that. He, he would just give these big, big speeches in these big auditoriums and thousands of people would come. But for whatever reason, a lot of people felt.